Wonderful to have you here. Uh, the meetings are each night at the same time, God willing, Monday through Friday of the week before us at 7.30. They are announced for an hour. They will not be longer than an hour. So if you're inviting people to come, you can assure them that the meetings will not go beyond the announced 8.30 ending and will perhaps even be done sooner. There's also, as um, you heard about the uh, papers at the back that will give you a sort of an overview of the whole series, there's also um, a small copy of the chart in case you want to put one in your Bible to show a neighbor, um, and it will help you perhaps to explain what the topics are about. Now, the chart at first look may seem a bit complicated. It actually was an attempt to simplify what I thought was complicated. The very valuable two roads chart that um, is in many, many halls had tremendous value. Uh, but I did notice that people who were not familiar with the gospel had trouble just because it was so overwhelming. There were so many biblical references. There were uh, passageways and arrows and um, chutes and ladders. And so I thought if there was a way of just simplifying it, so that uh, perhaps by the means of icons, some of those truths could be conveyed a little more um, simply. So that's what the chart is. The left-hand section of the chart deals, uh, titled The Two Roads into Two Destinies, is dealing with the future for individuals. So you could find out where you would be if you were to die by looking at this part of the chart, finding out which road you're on, just extend that road on beyond death, and you will know where you will be if you were to die. So the left-hand section is dealing with the future for individuals. The main body of the chart is dealing with the future for the world. What will happen after the Lord Jesus comes? His coming is pictured by this open door here and the door of salvation being closed. The woeful world conditions of that period are pictured by what are often called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That is the idea of these awful judgments bursting on the world scene with all of the rapidity and power of a war horse. And then we'll notice that the... Um, Enmity of the world will be directed particularly against the nation of Israel, just as we see it mounting and increasing today. There will come the meteoric rise to power of a man in the Middle East who will have worldwide control, particularly in the realm of economics, and holding the purse strings of the world, of course, will give him great influence over the entire geopolitical system. His charisma, his ability will all be inspired by Satan, who is pictured in Revelation chapter 12 as a scarlet dragon. And the wars and battles of this awful period of time will culminate in the campaign of Armageddon, which is not merely one battle, but a series of battles that will be fought in the Middle East. And when the human race is on the verge of annihilating itself, heaven is going to open again, and the Lord Jesus is going to come back. This white horse here is the picture of a coming conqueror. He will put an end to the battles that are taking place. He will set up his kingdom. These two icons here are representing what his kingdom will be like. Here is its heavenly sphere. Here is what it will be like on earth, the iconic picture of peace even in the brute creation. One final rebellion will be permitted. It will be put down by fire from God out of heaven. That will issue to the great day of judgment, the great white throne of Revelation chapter 20. And then, of course, beyond that, we have the new heavens and the new earth, or what is often called eternity. So you will understand that these are events that are given to us in the Bible. It is history written before it happens. That's what prophecy is. History written before it occurs. And it involves every one of us. So there may be times when a, a person even uh, in a meeting like this could perhaps speak about something that doesn't apply to everyone. But when we're looking at the future of each man and woman and the future of this world, that embraces every person who is here tonight. Now, would you turn, please, to Matthew chapter 7 for our reading this evening. Matthew chapter 7, the words of the Lord Jesus in verse 13. Matthew 7 and verse 13. Matthew 7 and verse 13. 13, enter ye in at the straight, the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I was having meetings in um, 
Ontario, Hamilton, Ontario some years ago, and there was a, a gentleman who was trying to come to the meetings, uh, and the problem that he made is he took a wrong turn when he started out. In other words, when he backed down his driveway, he went the wrong way. From that point on, he followed all the directions he had been given. So when he was told, go to the stop sign and make a left, he went to the stop sign and made a left. When he was told, go to the red light and go to the right, he went to the light and he went to the right. When he was told how far to go, he followed all of the rest of the directions to the letter. But he had started off wrong. And because he started off wrong, he was lost, wandering around Hamilton trying to find the gospel hall and the gospel meeting, simply because he started wrong. Now, you and I have started wrong. We came into this world as sinners. And our sins put us on the wrong road, heading in the wrong direction. And we want to focus our attention tonight, just for now, on these two roads in the hopes that you will find out tonight where you are. If I accomplish nothing more with God's help tonight, but that you faced honestly where you are on this road map to eternity, this would then have been a very valuable meeting for you. Where you are tonight, as you look at these two roads, just exactly where you are. Now, sometimes when um, things are being simplified, we talk about the ABCs. So here are the ABCs of this topic. The first is this, that all of us, all of us are traveling through this world to eternity. This is not something that just has to do with people who regularly come to the gospel hall. All of us are travelers. We are all moving. As I speak to you right now, our world is not only revolving, but it is moving around the sun and rotating at fantastic rate of speed. And yet none of us is really conscious of how quickly we are moving through space. Similarly, we are moving through time. We're aware of the clicking, the, the, the movement of the hours. We're aware of the passage of days on the calendar. But in another sense, we are all on a journey. We are going to eternity. So first of all, this involves you because all of us are going to this eternal world. B. The Bible is the only reliable source of information about that eternal world. It is the only reliable source of information. And there's a very important reason for that. Every other book, every other book that is ever written is the concept, the thinking of someone in this world projecting his thoughts out into the next world and envisioning what is there, trying to tell us what is there. When you come to the Bible, you are getting information from that world, from God. It's a difference between you being stuck. Now, I know uh, traffic here is not like it is in Toronto, but um, if you've ever driven uh, on the 401, if you've ever driven in Toronto, you know what a nightmare it can be. And you can be in this lane, and that car, that the cars in that lane are moving an inch, and you think, I should be over there. And so you worm your way in, and you get over there, and then the lane that you were in starts to move, and you think, I, I guess I should have stayed there. And, and the problem is, you can see maybe half a dozen cars that way. You can see the cars around you. You can look in the rearview mirror and see the cars behind you. But you can't command a sight of the whole road. Now, think of the difference if you had a friend in a high-rise building by the 401, or if, if there were a, um, a helicopter, and it's giving the traffic report. Now, now he's not limited, see? His scope is reaching the whole road. So he's saying, if you're in the left lane, stay there, because in 1.2 kilometers, there's a car on fire in the right lane, and everybody's trying to sneak by on the left. So you would then say, well, okay, now, you see, you're getting information, and you'd say, now I know, stay here. Because you just got information from somebody who saw so much more than you can see. When you come to the Bible, you're getting information from the God who sees the whole road and who is giving you information about heaven and hell, how you can reach the one and escape from going to the other. That's the B. The C, Christ alone can prepare you for heaven. Religion cannot, tears cannot, prayers cannot, baptism cannot, good works cannot. Christ alone can save you for eternity. Now, if we take his words 
I would suggest to you that, first of all, there is here a striking, a, a stunning revelation of truth. Because if we didn't have what the Bible tells us, particularly if we didn't have what the Lord Jesus tells us here, I don't think this is the kind of thing that we would intuit. I don't think we would sit down and we would infer from things we see around us that this was the case. Because we see people die. There's probably not a family here that has not followed a, a coffin up a green slope, watched it placed on the straps, and someone whom you love has died. The Lord Jesus is telling us here, all of us are traveling, but we're not traveling to a grave. We're traveling to eternity. He is reminding us that you are a soul. You live in a body, but you are a soul. Please don't make the mistake of imagining that you are just a body. You have a body, but that body's not you. You are a soul. And I think that the Bible's language, as always, is so precise. Do you remember how James put it? He said, as the body without the soul is dead. Flip his words, and he would be confusing a very basic biblical principle. He didn't say, as the soul without the body is dead, because the soul without the body still exists, but the body without the soul is lifeless, inert, unresponsive. It is either cremated or buried out of sight. It has no animation. It has no life, but you will exist forever. You will exist eternally. We are traveling, but we are traveling to eternity. And every girl, woman, man, and boy in this building is going to be in heaven or hell forever. So you see how it's so important to find out tonight which road you're on. Because what we are talking about is your eternal well-being. I was having meetings in the state of Maine. I think it was back in the 70s. And uh, we, we got a phone call one night from a neighbor. I was staying with my sister and her husband, and the neighbor said, my mother is old, and she is ill. She really can't come out, but she has a lot of questions about the Bible. Do you think it would be possible to visit her? And so the visit was set up for Saturday night. My brother-in-law and I went to see her. Her daughter welcomed us into her home. She said, my mother lives upstairs. Follow me. We went upstairs. I don't think I will ever forget what that elderly woman said. It seemed to me that every part of her statements were freighted with tremendous meaning. Listen to what she said. After we chatted, hello, how are you, and got our names, and she said, gentlemen, I'm an old woman. I'm going on a long journey, and I'm never coming back. I want to be sure I'm going to the right place. Can you men tell me how I can be born again? Got that? I'm going on a long journey. She was thinking about this pillar. She was thinking about crossing it into eternity. I'm going on a long journey. I'm never coming back. I want to be sure I'm going to the right place. You're on that journey tonight. You're never coming back. I hope you want to be sure you're going to the right place. And I hope that tonight you will find out from God how you can be born again. So the Lord Jesus tells us we're all traveling to eternity. Then he adds to it that we are all traveling on only one of two roads. That while we divide the world in so many ways, that God divides the world just this way. There are those who have his son, and therefore they have life. There are those who do not have Christ as their Savior, and they do not have life. He says, for instance, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that does not believe the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. He reminds us in unmistakable language. In fact, I think that, that Paul's use of the pronouns in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 are so significant, aren't they? He says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolishness, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Which pronoun describes you? Are you among them that perish or us who are saved? Because those are the words that describe people on this road. People on this road are perishing. People on this road are saved. Or the words the Lord Jesus used when he talked about coming to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you lost tonight or are you saved? Because we're all traveling on one of two roads. 
some years ago, it's a shame, you know, when you make one mistake and it lasts with you your whole life. But a, boy, a, a young man, a college student named Roy Riggles made one mistake and earned himself the title Wrong Way Riggles, okay? One mistake, and it clung to him for the rest of his days. He was a center, a center for the football team. California, his college, university. And the ball was fumbled. And Roy got turned around. The, the, the two lines had clashed, and Roy got turned around and suddenly saw the ball there that the quarterback or the running back had dropped. And Roy scooped up the ball, and he began to run. Only he was running the wrong way. Now, for those of you who are football challenged, had he picked up the ball and run the right way and crossed the goal line, he would have scored six points for his team. Go the other way, and you score two points for the other team. Here's Roy running the wrong way with the ball. As a result of that, his own teammates were chasing him, <laughs> trying to stop him from crossing the wrong goal line. I'm telling you this because I want you to know what Roy said years later. He said, I heard my teammates. They were yelling at me to stop. And I thought, now you listening? And I thought, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? I got the ball and I'm running. What's wrong with them? Do you know when it comes to these two roads? People hear what the Lord Jesus says, and they think. There's, people tell me that I need to be saved, that I need to be on the, the narrow way. What's wrong with them? I'm fine the way I am. No, the Lord Jesus says, we're not fine the way we are. You are either on a narrow way or the broad way. You have either been saved or you are still lost. Now, I would love to help anybody here tonight who may be confused about this because I certainly don't want to confuse anybody. Allow me just to mention to you from the Bible how you can find which road you are on. Everybody who is on the narrow way was once on the broad way. Now, that's pretty simple, except I can't tell you how many people I have met who, when they look at these two roads, will say something like this. Oh, well, I, I mean, I love God. I've always loved God. I, 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 I don't remember a time when I, I didn't believe there was a God and, and love God. Now, please understand, as we'll notice in a minute, everybody who was on the narrow way was once on the broad way. So if you talk to anybody here and ask that, uh, someone to tell you how he or she was saved, that person will likely tell you about the time when they discovered they were on the wrong road and they trusted Christ. So if you want to know what road you're on, just ask yourself, when did I find out I was on the wrong road? Because everyone who was on the narrow way was once on the broad way. And based on what the Lord Jesus says, everyone who was on the narrow way found the way. See, found the way. You don't have to find the broad way. It finds you. But you do need to find the narrow way. You do need to find the narrow way. The Bible uses language like, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The Lord Jesus spoke about striving to enter in that narrow gate, to not let anyone or anything stand in your way. The narrow way must be found. There must be a moment in your life when you find Christ, when you trust him. Now, gospel preaching is not a place for personal reference, so just allow me this one. I cannot remember a time in my life, if you said to me, when was the first time you fell in love with your wife? I, 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 I couldn't tell you. Poor thing, I think <laughs> I've always loved her, and I guess she had very little choice about that. But I, 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 I can't say, well, here it was. it was. That was the day, or no, that was the year. Or... I can tell you the time on the clock and the date on the calendar when I took her to be my wife. I can't tell you 
A time in my life when I didn't know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that the Bible told me if I trusted him, I'd be saved. I couldn't tell you when that first dawned on me. I heard that as a little child in Sunday school. I can't go back far enough to remember a time when, oh, listen to that. I never heard that before. I can't, I can't remember a time like that. I can tell you the exact date by the grace of God when I took him to be my Savior. July the 10th, 1966, in the third floor back bedroom of a row house in South Philadelphia, just about 14 blocks south of City Hall. If you've ever seen City Hall with the statue of William Penn on top of it, just about 14 blocks south of that. In that back bedroom after a gospel meeting like this, I went home with just one thought in my mind. How can I be saved from hell? How can I be sure I will never perish? How can I find salvation? And that night, at about quarter to ten on that Sunday night in July, I found out Christ died for me and took him as my Savior. I found the narrow way. Have you found it? Because the Lord Jesus is telling us that we are all traveling to eternity, that we are traveling on one of, two pl- one of two roads, that we are going to one of two places. Not three, not five, not half a dozen. The end of the narrow way is life in heaven. The end of the broad way is destruction in hell. Just those two destinies. Now, we've invented all sorts of things to soften the blow, to, to, to lessen the impact of that. And there are people who imagine, for instance, that you die and then you come back again so that they can have a future life without God. And then there are people who imagine you die and that's it, so they can have God without a future life. And there are people who imagine there are other places you go to and you're there temporarily. And then eventually, maybe you'll make it into paradise. But come to the Bible. And there are just two places. And as I scan the audience tonight, everybody here is on the way just exactly right now, this moment, everybody here, is on the way to either heaven or hell. That's what's so stunning about this revelation, isn't it? And then to add to it, one more thing. Not only does the Lord Jesus inform us that we are all traveling to eternity, that the entire human race is traveling on one of two roads, that at the end of those roads there's only two destinies, two destinations, two places. But then he tells us that the most of the people are on the wrong road. That you can't go by the majority. You can't say to yourself, well, you know what? In my town, there's so many people that believe this and so many people that believe this, but the most of the people believe this, so that must be right. You can't do that. You've got to come to God's word to find salvation. This is, as I say, a revelation from him that I think is stunning. But of course, here's something you'll notice about the Lord Jesus. He never, he never, speaks about these two roads and the door in a cold, callous, detached way. Never. So that even here, when he's going to tell us about the two roads, how does he start? Enter in. Enter in. He wants you to come. Luke chapter uh, chapter 13, when a man says to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And the Lord Jesus tells us about striving to enter in and about the door closing. He begins his words by telling the man, get in, strive to enter in. Don't let anyone stand in your way. Here is an invitation, and this invitation is based on the wonderful fact that Christ is offering salvation to everyone. He's offering salvation to you tonight. He's offering salvation to you tonight. Everyone is invited. His famous words in, John, in Matthew 11 are coming to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In the parable that he told about the... the Great gospel supper. Remember remember the words that went out, the invitation. Come. All things are ready. Come. And so God is offering salvation to you. Christ is inviting you to come to him. We're reminded that what happened is he opened the way of salvation at Calvary. This door, this, this emblem of an available salvation is all because at Calvary the Lord Jesus died to open the way back to God, to open the door. Do you, do you remember the words that John recorded? He was standing at the cross, and he saw a Roman soldier take a spear, and to verify that Christ had actually died, he stepped to the side of the Savior on the cross, and he plunged his spear into his side. John said, I saw it. I bore record. A soldier with a spear pierced his side, 
and forthwith came there out blood and water. I remember reading that once, and my mind flew back to the first book of our Bible. And God said to Noah, a door shalt thou put in the side thereof. A door shalt thou put in the side thereof. So here you had Noah and his family. With all of the danger to which they were exposed, a global flood was coming. Here was the ark with all of its potential to shelter them and save them. How is Noah, how are they, the family, going to get into the good of that, the ark? Through an open side. A door shalt thou put in the side of it. Here you are tonight in grave danger of losing your soul forever and perishing in hell and the lake of fire. There is Christ with all of his magnificent, incomparable ability to save you. How are you going to get into the good of that? He was pierced at Calvary for your sins. He opened up the way. Salvation has been made so simple and is explained so simply that you enter in. You know, I, I read once, I'm not going to read it to you, but I, I read once a scientific description of what it is like when you step through a doorway. Scientifically. And it talked about the pounds per inch pressing against you. And it talked about how the earth was spinning at such a fantastic rate of speed when you lifted your foot from one place and stepped it inside the door. But you didn't think of anything like that when you stepped through the door. You're probably looking at the plywood and thinking, wow, somebody broke the window, right? You, you weren't thinking about the difficulty of entering. You just stepped through. You just stepped through. All my young life, I complicated salvation. I, 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 I built it and, and built around it and tried to put my ideas into it about how you do it, what you, what you have to do. God is watching me, and I need to really feel really miserable, and I need to, I need to really build up a, a strong inner sense of, of confidence that I really, really believe this, and I had complicated it and made it so difficult to grasp. I was completely totally, thoroughly, absolutely lost. I had no idea how to be saved. And the night that God saved me, I was absolutely stunned by how simple it was. That it was all through Christ. That he did everything. He did the suffering. He did the paying for sin. He faced the penalty. He endured the judgment. He finished the work. He was just telling me to accept him, to take him, to let him do, be the one who does the saving. And that night, just as a helpless sinner, I trusted Christ. You know, I read a description of a, the account of a woman. She and her friend were um, down in California, and she was getting some pictures taken. Her friend was taking some pictures of her that she wanted. She was, she was uh, posing. She was poised on a rock. Now, what made this just a bit worrisome was that the, the woman I'm telling you about couldn't swim. So she's poised on the rock, and her friend is there, who can't swim, taking pictures of her. And uh, what added to the, the beauty of it, you see, where the, the, the waves were hitting the rock she was on and the spray, the spume would come up behind her and her friend is taking pictures, except one of those waves caught her. And out she went. And she can't swim. And I don't know if it was a riptide, but she was caught in a tide and it was pulling her away. She would have died, but a man named James... Primbrum was walking down the shore, and he is, he was, I suppose he still is, he was a professional surfer, and he saw this person flailing out on the water, and he dove in, and he swam out to her, and when he reached her, flailing and smashing the water and desperately trying to save herself, she stopped all that. And she let him come in, put his arm around her, and bring her into shore. I was so struck by the description because you know what he said? And I don't think he was talking from a biblical sense, but this is what he said. He said it was like a spiritual thing. He said she just, 
she just stopped. She just stopped thrashing in the water and let me grab her. And her account was, talk about simplicity, her account was, he saved me. <laughs> he saved me. And it may be your, I was, maybe your thrashing about trying to figure out how to be saved. Would you let him be the Savior? Would you, would you let him do the saving? Because on the simplest of terms, he is saying, enter in. Enter in. Step in. And you will be saved. Now, just one more thing before the meeting closes. I want you to think about the idea that is conveyed in these two diverging roads because they are introducing us to the very solemn topic of a final separation. See, we're all together here tonight. Other than finding you a, a seat where you would be comfortable, the ushers or someone at the back didn't say, well, now you'll have to sit over on this side, and then you can go to this side, and well, you can sit up there, but you can't. You need to. No, nobody did that. We're all sitting together. There are homes here where there are people in the home, living in the home, perhaps parents who are saved and children who are not, siblings who are saved, a brother is saved and a sister isn't, or a sister on the way to heaven and a brother still on the broad way. But we're all together here, aren't we? There's a moment coming when the separation will be final. The door that is open, pictured here, the door that is open is going to be closed. That is the graphic, picturesque, biblical way of conveying to you the fact that salvation is only being offered to you temporarily. If you take it, it'll be permanent, but the offer, the offer, it's only temporary. If you die and you've never stepped through the door, it will be too late. If the Lord comes and you have not yet stepped through the door. I think I'm safe in saying to everyone that is here tonight under this roof, you will no longer have the opportunity to be saved. The separation will be final. Allow me to tell you about a U.S. president, even though I'm in Canada. I think he was one of the most significant presidents we ever had, Ronald Reagan. And you will remember... If you've seen the video, you remember the confused look on his face when the assassin pulled the trigger and the bullet hit him. He didn't even realize he was hit. The Secret Service agents didn't even realize he had been hit. And he was pushed into the limousine and an agent on top of him and the door was closed. And when the agent picked himself up off the president and realized the president had been shot, he said to the man in the front, get us to the hospital. President Reagan was the oldest president, as far as I know, the oldest president to be president of the United States. The White House physician was a doctor named Dr. Donald Rouge, R-U-G-E. And Dr. Rouge had made a policy decision long before that 1981 date. So when, it was, when Reagan won the presidency, the White House president settled this as a policy. This president, if his life is ever endangered, he will be taken to the nearest medical facility equipped to meet his need, and he will be handled by the most competent person present at the time. In other words, there would be no flying him to some special hospital somewhere that was the best in the country whatever was the nearest. There would be no waiting once they got there for the top surgeon to be brought in because this was the president. He would be handled, he would be handled by the best available help right there. So I'll tell you what Americans, what we did not know. That bullet was an inch from his heart, and when they wheeled him into the emergency room for all his joking about, I hope you're all Republicans and, and all of that, for all his joking... It is estimated that he was 15 minutes away from dying. But he didn't die. And he was able to tell his son, Michael, I want to dedicate the rest of my presidency to God and to the American people. 15 minutes. 
Get him in a plane and fly him to the Mayo Clinic. He's dead. Get him to the nearest hospital and say, no, no, you're not competent. We're going to send for the top surgeon. And he's dead. But can you see that a decision, a decision that was made back here, now had incredible implications here. A decision that had been made months before, if not years before. A decision that had been made here. This is how we'll handle this if it ever comes up. Now comes into play in such staggering importance here when his life was on the line. If the Lord Jesus comes back, or for that matter, if the Lord Jesus does not come back before I die and I come to what is typified by this pillar, whenever that will be, There is something that happened at Calvary that I found out about on July the 10th, 1966 that will be of mammoth proportions the moment that I slip into eternity. Because Christ died for me and I trusted him as my Savior. And because he's my Savior, I'm going to be in heaven and not in hell. I found the narrow way. I entered the door. I trusted Christ. He saved me. He'll save you. He'll save you. If you will enter in tonight, shall we pray? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bow at the close of the meeting, and we have been reminded at the very commencement about the thousands upon thousands of souls that will be in heaven, all because of the precious blood of Christ. We thank Thee there are so many in the building tonight who have the assurance of eternal life and a home with God forever, and we ask for Thy blessing on Thy word and pray that Others here who came into the meeting still on the Broadway will find Christ tonight and trust him as Savior. We pray for safety as we go to our homes giving thanks in the Savior's worthy name. Amen.